The following episode of the Maui Chamber of Commerce's Business Matters was originally broadcast on March 5th, 2024. It's time now for Business Matters, brought to you by Mokulele Airlines. Now here's your host, Pam Tumpop. A very good morning, and here's your host, Pam Tumpop. Hi, Pam. How are you today? I'm great, and we have our fellow guest on the line, I believe, right now. So you can introduce oh. Kat if you wish. I will. Thank you so much. And welcome, everybody, to Business Matters Radio Show, sponsored by Mokalele Airlines. Um, today, we're going to have Kent Unterman on. He is a business owner of Family Brands, Pictures Plus, Coco Nene, Plus Interiors, and California Closet. And we're going to learn more about him. Let me give you a little bit of his background. Um, uh, in uh, 1986, Kent started his business at the Aloha Stadium Swap Meet. Um, it was a come and a company pictures plus has evolved from those very early and humble beginnings into a robust enterprise with over 150 employees statewide and annual sales of $25 million. The company specializes in a diverse range of locally manufactured products through its family of brands, which includes pictures plus, Coco Nene, Plus Interior, and California Closet. So we are excited to have him join us today to talk about his Maui expansion plans for his sister company, Coco Nene, which lost its flagship store on Front Street during the Lahaina wildfires. So good morning, Ken, and thank you so much for joining us today. Oh, thank you so much for having me. Really appreciate it. Oh, it's our great pleasure. The, uh, as we get started, maybe tell everybody a little bit about um, your, your start, Kukunemi, that uh, was on Front Street. Okay, yeah, no, I'm sort of a serial entrepreneur and sort of the foundation of everything that we do. I really believe in small business and, you know, kind of what I enjoy is seeing the people grow, watching them create sort of abundance and prosperity for their families and tried to have, you know, more sustainable manufacturing. Uh, we import so much of what we consume and we care a lot about, uh, that with regard to food, but we don't really hear much about durable goods because we just don't do that much of it. But Coco Nene is sort of a resort based, uh, really resonates with the visitor. Everything that we make is designed by artists who live in Hawaii and it's manufactured uh, on Oahu and then we have uh, lots of local folks that work for us in all the various stores and you know our single measurement is uh, hourly pay uh, so we're kind of unique in sort of what we believe in and, and what we do and Coco Nene was only about, it's only about five years old and our flagship store was on Front Street it was our single largest grossing most profitable store and so it was quite devastating and uh we we the team has done a really good job of of responding and working hard to uh replace those sales with new locations i i am uh yet just uh amazed to hear one all the things that you're involved in and, um, and, of course, you're speaking to my heart. For those who know, I have a background in helping local manufacturers for over 20 years. So to know that you're doing your, your manu you know, sourcing things local, using local artists, and and doing your own manufacturing um, is just phenomenal. And we are so sorry for the loss of, of the store and uh, the hardship that is created for your your company, your employees, and all who are assisting you with the business. Um, but I know with a serial entrepreneur, I've heard that you have uh, done a lot of things very quickly to pivot after losing this flagship store. Can you tell us about that story and what kinds of things you've done to move forward as quickly as possible and help others? Yeah, so, you know, we're fortunate to a couple things. Uh, 
well, we had really good business interruption insurance, uh, but because we make everything that we sell, we had to negotiate hard with the insurance company for them to realize that they also had to help us pay for local manufacturers. So just to, I'm pretty transparent, just want to help people. So that particular store had gross revenue of about a hundred, uh, $250,000 a month. And out of that 250, 155,000 all went back to local salaries, both on Oahu and in Maui. And so normal business interruption insurance does not cover cost of goods sold. But for us, 55,000 of that was people who worked in our factory. And if we went up get coverage for that, then, you know, it really could put us out of business. So we had to uh, move very quickly. In addition to that, because we're a local manufacturer and I just feel for other small businesses that don't have our means or experience. And so we did a little thing with ornament to try and support other businesses. Um, and, and I'm sorry, I'm jumping around here a little bit, specifically back to our expansion plan. We wanted to replace those sales as quickly as possible. I never dealt with business interruption insurance and dealing with the insurance company isn't an easy thing and you had kind of trials and tribulations. So the goal was to replace that bit absolutely as, as quick as we could. And so we have secured four locations, two were open. All of our people who worked on Maui are back at work. And that just felt really good. I can only imagine the trauma that they went through. Uh, five of our nine employees lost their homes. We were able to pay them in full uh, while they are out of work through our interruption insurance. But just that uh, sense of normalcy with the rest of the trauma they've gone through was just a really gratifying experience. So I if I answered your question, but I'll stop there. Well, uh, you, well that, that was amazing. And, um, and you bring up something that I keep sharing and we keep hearing, which is the importance of helping people get back to their normal routine, to have that sense of normalcy, get back to work, feel that sense of productivity, um, when so many things are, you know, still on their mind. And to know that you were able to, uh, yes, you've talked about uh, how difficult it is to work with insurance companies. We are working with so many businesses right now, and the stories are just tremendous on the hurdles they've had to overcome. You know, you, you never really think about all of the processes that go into place when you need to utilize your insurance. So we've heard so many challenges with that. And I'm so glad that you're sharing the story so people can learn from it. And, and as we move forward, really think about their insurance and how they can work with their agent to better understand what the coverage is, what it covers, what it doesn't, and think through how they go about it to know that you're able to do that, get four new locations, and keep everybody employed by yourself through the business as you got them back to work is tremendous. Um, and and I, you've done all this at such a rapid pace. How, you know, we've, we've also heard stories about how difficult it is to be able to find new locations to pivot into and rising costs in the retail space. Can you tell us a little bit about how that went? Yeah, sure. No, we're really fortunate, sort of, by crazy entrepreneurial spirit. You know, we're able to self perform literally on everything. So we actually design, we have a contractor's license, we execute, we make all of the fixtures for all of our stores, we make all of our product. So that is uh, the only way we were able to do all that. I've negotiated over a hundred leases in my career. I've got good relations with brokers and landlords and and i was you know I, I felt a little guilty about this but not too guilty from the stamp i was literally negotiating leases the the next day from the fire and uh yeah i i was worried that sounds a little insensitive but as the leader of the company i've got 150 employees relying on me as the leader of the company to you know put food on the table for them and then they have family members. So the sense of responsibility uh, is, is so large uh, when you're a small business owner for all of your employees. And we've got so many hardworking, loyal employees. So it was, uh, it was 
has been very stressful. I think at times the team thought I was going too fast. And, you know, I had the concern. I didn't want to look back a couple of years and go, gosh, why did I do that? But we, we have, you know, le leases and locations we wouldn't normally do. We're in Kalama Village in a little walk up 500 square foot space for Ma Malalaya Harbor uh, that we wouldn't normally do, but we said, okay, the other harbor's out. There's going to be more whale activity there. Uh, so really tried to be strategic about it, but from for us, uh, you know, businesses run out of cash. People don't realize the number one reason businesses go out is because you run out of cash. And so that was my concern, and that was sort of the spirit of what pushed me so hard, and that we're just so fortunate that we're able to self perform under normal circumstances. It's really hard, and you are so correct on on the cost of build out uh, for retail is is really high right now. But because we reacted really quickly, we kind of got in front of everything. We're really fortunate that we were able to do what we did. That's amazing. Uh, in addition to your insurance, did you um, consider or take out an idle loan? You know, we had idle loans from COVID, and mm -hmm. sadly, the EIN number that we were in, which was probably the wrong one from 20 years ago, they said because our sales were over $20 million, we didn't qualify. They did call me back and say, hey, maybe we could. I just did it. You know, it's really hard. People don't realize the idle loan, the SBA loan, all you have to qualify for, which means you have to demonstrate the ability to pay that back. For us, we got disqualified because the uh, whatever code we were under, max at $12 million, our sales were above that. We could, we we're going to go back and try to get some money, but what we had to do is I had to get uh, money through Shopify, which was very expensive money. But I went ahead and did it just because, again, you know, we're kind of racing against time. And so, fortunately, we were able to kind of use that. And then the, the insurance proceeds allowed us to sort of float our normal cash flow. Uh, so, we've been able to make it work. We were just below the threshold of the local bank uh, profitability-wise. So, you know, they're very conservative. So, that, that, that's another huge challenge for small business is, uh, is uh, banking. Yeah, it, it's been a tremendous, a tremendous challenge, and we've had a lot of people uh, directly impacted by the wildfires. One, well, many people already, like you, had idle loans and said, "Look, we we can't take on any more debt, especially now that this has happened." Um, others have tried, and we've had some underwriting issues with the SBA saying, "You know, people, we can't see your ability to repay." And they're saying, well, "Neither can I at the moment, but we've created something out of nothing before, and we can again." So we're really working with that, and we've had many loans stalled, but we <clears throat> we now have a direct line concierge service with the SBA um, to make sure that everybody gets an answer, that they can apply for reconsideration if they uh, want to do that. And a lot of people who are stalled, we've, we've had many meetings with the SBA and, and are now doing direct help where we have gotten stalled loans through. So we want to encourage everybody to call us if you're in that boat. Um, but I also like that you mentioned, you know, that that there are other lenders in times where it's, it's unfortunately not the same interest as the SBA, but that there are other places um, where you can access funds, like Shopify and uh, I think Quicken Loans and others. Are, uh, some people have gone that route as well. Yeah, no, and, and it's, um, it's, what's hard, your point is, you have to be able to demonstrate the ability to pay and for some of these people, depending on their situation, if they haven't been able to, you know, recoup and get back on their feet, depending on what their situation is, and then the cost of rebuilding, and if they were underinsured, and so many of the uh, businesses about Front Street were either not or underinsured. I know almost almost all the art galleries were not insured, and then you had artists that lost everything, and I think that's, it's, it, you know, it's just so sad, and so like you, we just want to help people in any way we can. Yeah. And I heard you have. I heard that you've been finding ways to help other businesses uh, that have been impacted by the fires and the downturn 
you know, uh, I, I understand you were bringing other products and tell us a little bit about that and how you've been able to help others. Yeah, so what we did, we, we make Christmas ornaments and we do them for other businesses, cheap holiday cookies, crazy shirts. And so we had the idea just to any business want to participate, we would, uh, we would design, make, and sell the ornaments and then give them, you know, kind of cover our cost and we keep our people busy. And so we sell the ornaments for $14 and we give uh, the participating business the uh, $7. So we give, we give them half, you know, per, and no obligation, no cost, no risk. Uh, and then we did a Mau couple of Maui Strong ornaments. And those ornaments, we would donate half to the various businesses. And, and we've raised a few thousand dollars. I am a little disappointed. I, I had hoped that we could kind of maybe go viral with it and really, you know, raise tens of thousands to help these little businesses. So we'll be making those distributions and kind of reconciling that. Probably it, it slowed down quite a bit at the end of this month. But just like everybody else, you know, we just felt the, the, the good thing about this is everybody from everywhere really wanted to help. And so we were trying to leverage that with our ability to kind of pivot quickly and manufacture products and just any amount of cash that we could generate and exposure to the other thing that we did is we tried to expose all of their website uh, on ours to uh, we have a, we have a uh, thing called highbiz.com where we do these ornaments every year for other mostly Oahu businesses but because of the wild wildfires we decided to do it specifically for uh, Maui businesses so you know it feels good to try and help I, I just wish we could do more. <laughs> I certainly hear that, but I think you're doing tremendous things, and the, and I know we also wish to do more. We we too were trying to help and had a a company trying to produce some t-shirts for us, and it it was an interesting challenge. Uh, it was very slow going, um, and and I'm so glad some of the brands that really took off strong, and we're helping to raise a lot of money. Um, and we also have the Chamber Foundation, and we're raising money for businesses, but we're we're just trying to get it to a level where it's enough to really do something meaningful for those directly impacted because even some of the grant money that's come out has been, you know, a few thousand dollars and, and um, um, we're up to like 12500 But we're we're really trying to help some people pivot and make a, you know, meaningful difference and move forward while also trying to explore programs to get a little bit of money here and there to, to keep them afloat. So it's it's a balance, but every every bit counts. And as you said, so many people have have reached out and poured their love into Maui and their their dollars to help in so many different ways. It, it's really a blessing to see how cherished uh, the people of our island really are and how much people appreciate this special place. No, that's so true. And, and I think that that's just to acknowledge that and and, and that's really what we're trying to do is just kind of perpetuate that because it is such a special place. And I think the other thing, you know, specific to Lahaina, that there's a story that hasn't been told, and I really, uh, enough anyway, I really appreciate what you're doing, is how many, you know, I think what, what the everybody needs to understand is how viable and, and by, how much vitality, financial vitality, I should say, there is in Front Street for small business people, you know, artists, proprietresses, hair salons. I heard there's like 22 hair salons. And so the sort of not well enough told story is it helps so many small businesses. Even the landowners in Lahaina are all families, Kamahaina families, people live here. So if you look at sort of, you know, larger corporations and, and, and so forth, it's really the, the, the benefit and utility of that 769 million or whatever we think it is of revenue that poured into Lahaina stayed in the islands and stayed in that local community. So in addition to these people losing their houses, a lot of them lost really viable income. And so I think, you know, from my vantage point, you know, we need to be balanced to what we do, but we, we need to bring that back and we need to bring it back sooner than later because if we lose the fabric of all of that vitality financially for so many small businesses and artists and proprietresses, and there's just so much wealth that stays in the island, which 
to me with tourism, you know, that's what really what we want is we want those dollars to stay in the islands and, and specifically to Lahaina, a, a, a large majority of that money stays in the islands. And I think we need to tell that story better. God bless you and amen. <laughs> we do. And uh, especially now, there's a lot of bills and, and so many um, activities, legislative activities in the work trying to look at, as well as um, non-legislative activities, but sort of driven by a county and state, the Mali Economic Recovery Commission, many, many um, local economic development programs and ways had many built to look at economic development programs right now and and help us recover and it's so important that people understand that the number and it was one of the things we find about front street is it's so challenging to get like the actual number of all of the businesses because there everybody has a different piece of that pie you know the chamber has a number the Lahaina Town Action Committee has a number, you know, um, retail people who were doing retail for years in Lahaina have different numbers, but there were also little avenues and nooks and crannies and just little small places and, and in some cases little businesses within businesses. And, you know, it, it really was such an amazing retail town that people cherished, the likes of which people are, are trying to recreate in other areas until Lahaina can come back. But... You know, there's such a strong interest in that community in bringing Lahaina back, and we need to do it in the right way, and we need to get the community involved. But we need to start pivoting as quickly as possible and understand how many people were dependent on that, and right now, how many people are still struggling because it, it hasn't come back, and they're still in a situation where they're not fully back at work. Um, every day we're hearing news stories. The stories of people leaving, and it, we're, we're fighting really hard as the chamber with housing being our top priority because with people being housing insecure, it's very hard for them to carry on. So just want to let everybody we know that we're working hard on that, and uh, please join us if you can help. Uh, with all that you've done, I, I mean, I when I heard your story, <laughs> and, and I'm very familiar with a couple of your businesses, and I, I just had no idea how many different businesses that you did, but I did know you did the manufacturing on Oahu and was totally impressed by that and, and was really excited to learn about the breadth of the different companies. Now that you've pivoted, you've got these four stores. Um, what's next for Coco Nene and some of your other businesses here, like Pictures Plus? Yeah, so it's really just to perpetuate. You know, we've we've got several different venues, but it it the 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 goal is is you know we measure our success by our average hourly wage. Our average hourly wage across our whole organization is thirty one dollars and thirty seven cents, and we have wow. various. Yeah, you know, and we 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 work on family based culture, taking care of our people, wellness programs, and we we also have performance based. You know, we want people to be motivated and excited to go to work. And so, in our retail sector, we have what we call entrepreneurial managers. Where there's you know the the more they can drive the business and perform, the more they get taken care of. We're investing heavily in machinery and equipment so that we leverage that so that we compete with the world, whether it's a cabinet, a closet, a picture frame, or, you know, a resort item that a tourist is going to take home. And so really trying to just strengthen the diversity of our brands. Uh, you know, we have, we're in the construction industry with our closets and cabinets. We're in the resort markets with Coco Nene and that Pictures Plus is more of a local brand. So we're doing different things to strengthen those. In the case of Pictures Plus, we're going a lot more into printing. The young yeah. demographic isn't framing as much. So lots of different things. But the end goal is really just to take care of our of our people and watch them grow and, and, and work on ways to be more efficient so that uh, the average hourly wage increases across the board. I, I absolutely love that. We spend a lot of time on those on uh, educating people about a living wage and also the difference between that and the minimum wage, but, but you know, the inputs and the things we need to look at to, to bring that up. And I, I just love hearing that 
you folks have gotten to a great point. That's amazing to hear that that 3170 is your average um, hourly wage is tremendous. So great job. I'd love to work with you and, and have you do a few sessions for us if you're available. <laughs> I think we could do some great programs together and, and would love to connect on that. But uh, truly, what a, what a remarkable company. And I just want to thank you for all the work that you have been doing to quickly pivot, to get your workers feeling secure and, and cared for and back to work um, and giving them that sense of normalcy. We're, we're trying to do it for everybody impacted. And I greatly admire what you've been able to do. Well, thank you so much. And anything, yeah, I'm happy to work with you in any way I can. And, you know, I, I, I have I have the benefit of I've been in an organization called YPO, Young President Organization. And I, I've got the mentorship and learning from just people way smarter than me. And so I'm always happy and open uh, to give back and mentor uh, others because that that gift is sometimes better than money itself is just really being given the tools and and ability and insights from experience I, I've made so many mistakes in my life and so, so oftentimes I can help people saying hey you know <laughs> I made that same mistake let me help you not make it so however I can help I'm I'm happy to help and really appreciate the opportunity and just really believe in small business and the kind of the fabric of the community and I think the more we can help that Hawaii is just such a special place and, and, and Maui, you know, I think I came, I came to Maui as a young boy when I was like 10 years old and it's just, oh. it's just such a special place and the islands are so special and we need to help each other out. We do. We absolutely do. And, and, uh, you've been doing an amazing job. Thank you so very much. And it was a great pleasure to have you on the show today. Um, I look forward to talking with you again very soon. Sounds great. Aloha. Thank you so much. Thank you. Aloha. All right. We're going to take a quick break to hear from our sponsor, Mokulele Airlines. I'm going to share some uh, news about our BizMix event coming up and a quick legislative update. And then we are going to talk to Le Lehia Apana, a small business owner and founder of Poli Poli Farms. Coming up next. Mokulele Airlines operates the largest commuter airline hub in the country, right here in Kahului. Fly Mokulele from Kahului to Molokai, Lanai, Hana, Waimea, Kona, and now Hilo. Mokulele also operates the only flights between Kapalua and Honolulu. There is never a middle seat on Mokulele, and every seat has a window and aisle. Visit MokuleleAirlines.com and take your next flight from the newly renovated Mokulele Terminal. And welcome back. Well, what a thank you, Cindy. We are um, excited to announce everybody that we, if you haven't heard already, we have the third annual Biz Mix Maui, a fun kind of uh, fun small dinner plate avant garde dining experience with specialty cocktails, phenomenal food by restaurant tours, as well as the Grand Wailea's team and some local restaurant favorites. And we're really thrilled that it's going to be happening again this year on March 16th from 6 to 9.30 p.m. at the Grand Wailea. This year's theme is Under the Sea. You can dress in green or blue or have sea-themed clothing or costume if you want. There'll be a lot of different uh, performers there to give you a special night along with great food and fun, um, and a silent auction as well. But I just really want to mention our open ocean sponsor, which is our title sponsor, Alaska Airlines, our deep sea sponsors, HCD and Pacific Media Group, our big swell sponsors, Ainalani Pacific and Encore, our Coral Cove sponsors, Goodfellow Brothers, Pacific Rim Land, and Koi Radio. And we just want to thank all of our sponsors, let people know this is whether you're a chamber member or not, we invite you to come, mix and mingle, get to know uh, businesses that are involved in the chamber, and join us for a phenomenal celebration. Tickets are $250 per person, and you can find them at MauiChamber.org. And we also want to share a little bit about the work we do. We are very actively involved 
not only in county legislation, but annually in the state legislative session each year. And this has been um, an interesting legislative session for sure, given what's occurred with the wildfires. Um, The legislature operates on a biennium, which means it's a two-year cycle. So some of the bills that were introduced last year that didn't die are still alive. So um, we had 1,305 House bills with action in uh, 2024. And then we also had 1,417 Senate bills with action this year. So that was a total of 2,722 bills that were either introduced or still alive this year. We are literally tracking 400 of those bills. And many of the bills this session deal with the Maui recovery and economic diversity and development, uh, wildfire plans and protection, wildfire funds, um, a state fire marshal, and so much more. And all of these bills um, and many more are trying to improve our economy, build resiliency, build sustainability, and address the devastation from the wildfires and prevent it from happening again, not only here, but across the state. And Pamela, as, as our, well as our, our next strong, guest is... Uh, funding for recovery efforts. Ah. So we are com- we are engaging on these bills, working with members of the community and, and different organizations to ring in, getting different uh, levels of community input, and watching as the community as well engages with the legislature and encouraging people to consolidate the ideas. Sometimes the bills overlap, and there can be good ideas in different bills, but um, we, there's ways to consolidate this. So we're looking at the overlap in between and testifying on bills, uh, housing, family leave, manufacturing, internship programs. There's bills that want to increase the TAT. We're dealing with invasive pass, taxes, um, fees on businesses or new licensure requirements for some industries. So there's a lot of things that are being heard and they move very quickly. Um, this week we've been on crossover, so that means they're heard in one house, and now the, uh, they'll cross back over to the originating house, and so they'll be heard again after the input from the other house. So we're ringing in and just kind of wanted to let everybody know um, it's been it's been a wild ride, but if there's a measure that's concerning to you, please reach out to the Maui Chamber of Commerce at 244 uh, zero zero eight one two four four zero zero eight one and let us know uh, we're here to help and we're here to address Maui issues as we ring in this legislative session and Pamela uh, because they're crossing over quickly this week and they'll be heard <laughs> next week we're going to start having hearings again okay Pamela okay. Pamela and, and I understand like, who is on the line yes, who's on the line <laughs> Yay! Thank you, Stacy. All right, so I it's my great pleasure to welcome uh, not Lahia, excuse me, Lahia. It's Lahia Abana and her partner, Brad Bayless, founded Poli Poli Farms in Waihu, Maui. As a Native Hawaiian-owned farm, they follow ancestral technologies to grow important cultural foods. Then they turn those harvests into healthy and convenient packaged foods which is a model that leads to healthier people and a healthier planet. And I think we've been seeing them on some recent uh, television commercials as well. Uh, Poli Poli Farms is in the Nawaihu region that is famous for the abundance of fresh water. And they have purchased a parcel in 2017. It was covered with thick grasses and invasive trees, so they had a lot of work clearing that land to get ready for the farming. But they discovered traditional terraces for growing kalo and an ancient rock wall. So it is a really stunning and beautiful place. It's a powerful reminder to them that this Ida is culturally and historically significant and that Poli Poli Farms sits on the same land that fed generations of Native Hawaiians. The original mahiai of this place is practiced uh, through regenerative agriculture, and they strive to follow in their footsteps. Their mission is to revive the legacy of this aina and region by feeding the people of Hawaii, the food of Hawaii. Good morning, Lahia. How are you? Hey, good morning. Thanks for having me. Oh, it is our great pleasure. We are so excited by the work that you are doing. 
can you tell us a little bit about creating this farm and and your passionate mission? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I I could go really far back, but we'll start kind of in in 2011. Um, My then boyfriend, now husband, Brad, and I, we just started becoming interested in growing food. And so we started with a tiny garden bed, a little box in the backyard, and we just got hooked. And, you know, every everywhere that we would move, we, you know, plant plant some, some food and kind of max out the space that we had until um, it was in 2017 that we decided, um, we started looking for, you know, land, something larger. And with the hopes of one day maybe having a farm, maybe a retirement project, you know, one day kind of thing. Because we were both yeah. uh, professionals. And so we were able to purchase um, where we live now here in Waihu. And at the time, it was just a completely overgrown jungle filled with invasive trees, <laughs> invasive grasses. And so in those early years, you know, we we do our full-time jobs. And then after work or on the weekends, we slowly clear the land. Mm-hmm. And eventually um well then the pandemic happened in 2020 and that was kind of the turning point for us where we decided to take those dreams that seemed really far away um and and do them now and so that's when we decided to go full-time into farming and it kind of turned into it from a hobby into what we're now doing full-time as a business yeah and it's it's amazing Tell people a little bit about the products that you offer because uh, you were able to quickly move forward with products that people really cherish. Yeah, so um, I guess I'll start with with how we're growing. And so we're growing native and Polynesian plants in an agroforestry setting, or you might hear it called food forest. Um, But basically, it's an ecosystem, right, with all these different layers and levels um, of plants. And so, and trees as well. And so, we're young agroforests. So, right now, we're utilizing the plants that are available to us um, because some of, you know, for example, trees take quite a bit longer to grow. Um, and so, yeah. we're producing a Hawaiian herbal tea made with mamaki and ulu. And then we also have our tree dry bananas, which is maia or bananas, um, which was a canoe crop that was brought over by the early Polynesians. Um, and then mamaki is a native plant here already. And then, of course, ulu was brought by the early Polynesians as well. And so our model is to take our harvest and put them into shelf-stable package products. Um, so that's what we're doing right now. And as our agroforests mature, we're going to be adding to our, our line. I just love hearing that and and learning, you know, as you're sharing with us how you're doing it, the... the um, the way that you're connecting with culture and, and tell us a little bit about, you know, this, this indigenous perspective with farming. Ooh, that's a big question. Um, I think there's a lot of ways that I could answer that, but the first thing that comes to mind is this concept of Ohana and this familial connection to, to mm-hmm. Aina and to, you know, to this land and to the food that, that we're growing, um, in the, you know, in the Hawaiian creation stories, you know, it talks about um, Haloa or Kalo being the, the original ancestor to all of us. So if you think about it in that way, um, you can really start to understand the Hawaiian perspective, right? The indigenous perspective of, of the environment being our family. And so when you have that perspective, you're going to treat something a lot differently than say, you know, just something to make money or something to extract from. So I think that's really central. Um, yeah. You know, when we're, especially when we're dealing with Aina and as farmers, is to approach the thing, the, the Aina and the plants that we're working with as family, as something that you care for, this reciprocal relationship. Um, and I think, I think that's something that, even beyond farming, <laughs> is a good attitude to have. Um, is kind of, we're all in this together and, and kind of, caring for these things in a holistic way. Yeah. Absolutely. And in um, in this, you you know, you're really also connecting with 
the importance of the traditional Hawaiian food system and creating things that you feel are products that will help people um, connect with, you know, with food and, and also a healthier lifestyle or things that um, will take care of them. Can you talk a little bit more about, I know some of this was covered in your bio, but a little bit more about how you're doing that and how you came to choose the products that you, you're offering. Mm. Or how they chose yeah. you. <laughs> yeah, you hit on a couple of, of, of things. I mean, the, the healthy lifestyle, um, these healthy foods, that's something that's really important um, to us. And maybe I can share a little bit of story about my own personal life. And that, that can kind of help you to understand why we're doing um, why we're doing it in yeah. the way that we're doing it today. But, you know, growing up, uh, I, you know, uh, times were rough. Uh, money was scarce. Time was scarce. And so um, we did the easy thing and the cheap thing, which oftentimes meant that food came through a drive through window or it came, mm-hmm. you know, frozen in a box. Um I love my TV dinners growing up, you know, and that was <laughs> kind of, um, and, and things like kalo were not on our di- dinner table. They were a special occasion kind of food. And so these convenient foods were not the foods that um, culturally, um, that weren't cult- culturally aligned, right? Mm-hmm. And so um, little, well, as an adult, so that's just kind of as a baseline to understand, like, I, I wasn't always eating these foods. And as an adult, um, I craved these foods, but I didn't really have access to them until um, I was actually working at the Maui Ming um, at the time. And across the street, there's a, a cafe. Well, across the street, yeah. there's a, a native Hawaiian health center called Hui no Keo Lopono. And they have a cafe, healthy yeah. healthy cafe. You know, it sounds like you. you I do. Uh, we used to be located at the camp, J. Walter Cameron Center. Yes. Oh, perfect. Yes, I'm sure you, you went there often. And, and you, you probably remember they um, they served fresh steamed kalo and fresh steamed uala. And so I would I would walk across the street um, almost every day, you know, get my kalo, yep. um, add it to my lunch. And then I I started ordering extra kalo and then I bring it home and, and Brad and I <laughs> would have kalo over the dinner table. And so then that started my relationship with these foods again. And that was really a big sort of gateway food um, for us to do what we're doing today. Because once we started wow. eating it, then we started planting it. We started loving it. We started to have this relationship with it. And that's because it was accessible and easy for me um, yeah. to get, right? And it met me where I was. If someone had given me, uh, you know, a dirty corm straight from the ground, I wouldn't have known what to do with it. And so right. that's something that really sticks in, in our head. Um, you know, and so that's what we want to do with our products is make them easy, accessible, and meeting people where they're at today. You know, like, for example, the Mamaki and Ulu, like, people don't always have access to these sorts of plants. So now they do. If they just go to our website, they go to the store, you know, they can start that relationship. So I think that's something that's really, really important to us is to keep it uh, healthy and to keep it accessible. Um, And on the healthy side, you know, Native Hawaiian, I mean, as a Native Hawaiian, it's a very personal thing. You know, we have the highest rate um, of obesity and just negative health outcomes. And that's directly related to our food and, and kind of going away from our traditional foods. And, you know, today, and it's not a problem that's exclusive to Native Hawaiians. You know, the Western diet is filled with highly processed food um, yeah. and kind of going away from whole foods. And so um, whether you're Native Hawaiian or not, I think it's important to kind of realize that and it's time to go back to some of these um, healthier foods, you know. And, and I've been there, too. Like I said, as a young kid, um, I lived off of box food and, and through drive through windows. So um, it's a change that we've seen so benefit our life so much. Um, and that's kind of what we're trying to do with our products is make that available to other people as well. Yeah. Well, you, you're doing a, an amazing job, and I see you on the new HTA commercial. 
that is coming out. Yeah, uh, and uh, it's exciting to it's exciting to see. And and you are, are you clerks now doing tours? Um, we're, well, we did for a little bit. Um, we did tours, and then we'd have um, school groups come. Um, but right now, all of that is on pause because we have another really exciting thing happening on the farm. Um, we're in the process. So this year is year of the infrastructure. I've been calling it. We're in the process oh. of. <laughs> <laughs> so. Um, we're building an on-farm food processing hub. And right. so um, that is, yeah, that is really exciting. You know, as I mentioned, our focus is the value-added product, right? These packaged products. Yeah. And so that's going to kind of close, start to close that loop for us, right? Right now we have to go off-site to do that. Um, and by bringing the kitchen here, we can expand our own planting. We can start to aggregate from other farmers. So it's really kind of taking it to um, that next level, that food systems level, right? Like going from being a single farmer, producing our, our products to really trying to be part of the food infrastructure um, in our region and on this island. So, so yeah, so as far as farm tours, those are taking a back seat right now um, <laughs> to, to our, our building projects. Um, but that is something that's you. important to us. As well, and what kind of uh, farm processing equipment are you? What do you, what will the equipment allow people to do? So our our um, so I, I mentioned hub, and and sometimes that kind of throws people off. They think of things like Maui Hub or other hubs where um, other businesses use it. In our yeah. model, we're trying to 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 take that because a lot of farmers they just want to grow and. Um, we're trying to take our model um, and our systems and our channels and grow that and allow our, us to aggregate more products. So we'll be aggregating from other farmers and then creating them into our current products and expanding our, our product line. So the hub um, really would just allow us to, to grow as a business and start to, start to sort of um, yeah, increase the aggregation that we're doing. I think it's phenomenal. And so, oh, yeah, so, because... I don't know if I really answered oh, your question, but basically we do a lot of dehydration. We try to keep the the product in as close, you know, of a state as they, they're coming off of the farm. So convert, uh-huh. preserving them very simply. Yeah, I think it's fantastic, and and I, I appreciate you explaining that because you're right. People have when we talk about these hubs, everybody has sort of a, a different perspective. We've seen so many different models, but as as you're expanding your product line and working with other farmers, uh, you know, as you're saying, often some people just want to farm. They don't necessarily want to do product, but then you're helping them by you know working with them on their products and putting that into or working with them on what they produce and putting that into your products you're helping them sustain their families and and create additional income and we need all of these models we, i sort of feel like we need everything and you know it, it, it all has such value as we continue to to work with our local communities to come up with these specialty models and help those who want to manufacture, manufacture, um, but, you know, uh, create new avenues for them as well as create more models for farmers where they can get involved and, and families can utilize more of their land and create additional produce um, and generate some new income to sustain themselves yeah. going forward. And, yeah, very it's exciting. Awesome. Yeah. And you said it's you said, really um, amazing. Farmer. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, no, you said farmers, and, and that's true. Oh. And actually, even going beyond that, even um, smaller growers, you know, yeah. you know, I look at the Hawaii Ulu Co-op as a great model. Um, uh-huh. If you have one Ulu tree, you can be part of their co-op. If you have, you know, 10 acres of Ulu trees, you can be part of their, their co-op. And so they, and, and they'll purchase, you know, from the the backyard farmer with one ulu tree and i think that's really powerful because i think it gets more people um access to be able to participate mm-hmm. in that part of the food system right you don't have to be a humongous farmer with acres and acres yes. um so that's the model that we're looking at and really i think that's really smart um 
I Thank agree. So, and, and it starts with all one level, you know? <laughs> one tree, right. you can right. participate. What is that? I said it starts with one. You've got one tree and you can yeah. participate. And when people see those opportunities, you know, then, then over time they may plant more or they may not. But it, it's great to know that uh, we can engage everybody at that level. I love that you're looking at that as a model for what you're looking to do. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So I know there's one thing that uh, sometimes people get a little confused by because of the name Poli Poli connected with your product um, and the place. You want to, can you share a little bit about that? Oh man, we, we agonized over this. Yes, that, you know, the first, one of the first things uh, we thought of was like, what, what are we going to name the farm? Um, and so the first thing we did was we looked at the traditional place name of this specific Ina that we're on. And lo and behold, we see Poli Poli. <laughs> and we're like, oh no. <laughs> you know, I, I came from a, a, a media journalism um, background. And so, so my brain at that time went to, oh, we can't do that because there's this other Poli Poli that's, um, already well known it's confusing all of this stuff right yeah and um so we kind of shelved that idea then i we spoke to um uh, a friend and kind of a cultural advisor to us and we asked him like, we'd like hey you know we're, we're we're trying to name our farm can you help us do you have any ideas and he said well what's the traditional name of of your aina and he said well yeah we already looked that up it's, it's poli poli so it can't be that and he's Pam, Pam we have one minute, Pam, one minute till the show's over. Okay, thank you. Cindy. Oh, okay, I'll try to make this fast. And so he, he was like, well, okay, you know, he was teaching with us, and he said, that's why you should name it Poli Poli, because it's a teaching tool. It's something, you know, not something to be, to shy away from. And so that was a really good lesson, and that was kind of, um, I'm embar- I was embarrassed by that initially, but it was kind of a turning point for me to, start to think in this indigenous way once again, you know, not from the marketing standpoint, but really from educating people that this is poli poli as well. And in um, in Hawaii, there's multiple places to share That's names all the time, you know? Yeah. So we are poli poli as well. Yeah. And real quick, can you give everybody your website where they can find you and learn more? Absolutely. Um, it's easy. Polypolyfarm.com. Awesome. Lahia, thank you so much for joining us today. Unfortunately, we're about to.